Welcome to the Your Money Personal Finance Podcast. I'm David Pratt, along with the president of Everything Financial, Peter Shishecki. Morning, Dave. How are you today? Yes, good to see you again, as always. And apparently, we have ourselves a special guest to. Uh, to we do have a special to guest. add a little Absolutely. something extra to the, all of this. A notary republic by the name of Bart Aldrich. Good to have you on the show. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Glad to be here. We've got lots to talk well, he about. Doesn't know he doesn't know us well, oh. Dave. He's using the term gentleman already. <laughs> I've known Bart for 25 years, Bart. Wow. 20, almost 26. Goes back a long way. And I reached out to Bart and, and very thankful that he agreed to, to join us here and record this um, because... I get the questions all the time and I about what Bart does. And I just went, let's get the expert on to explain all the things a notary does because it's way beyond my pay grade. So I'm going to let the expert talk today. Well, we've got our top 10. Are you ready for it, Bart? Hopefully. Fire away. Here we go. We're about to, we're about to find out. Here we go. Number one on the list, the services a notary can provide. And let's start with real estate and estate planning. Sure. Um, so estate planning, um, basically my, my, uh, type of work can be divided into three categories. So estate planning documents, such as wills, power of attorneys, representation agreements, uh, real estate conveyancing. Uh, so that's transferring property and then just general notarization, something that requires my signature to, to witness someone signing a document. Gee, I could do that. Peter, could you do that? I could witness. No, I can't do that. Can't do I can't do that. I've, I've, uh, I've had to get a lot of documents witnessed okay. over the years, and it's like, Bart, <laughs> are you in? I'm coming over. <laughs> and, and, and because I get stuff all the time that says, this must be witnessed by a notary. And I call, and Bart comes while well, I go to see him, but he comes to the rescue and make, and make sure we get these things done the right way. Because, And I'm sure as we get in later into this podcast, yeah. We'll give some specific examples of that, but yeah, he's always there to make sure you get things done the legal way, if you will. The next big question is, do you need a will? Well, that's a good question. Most individuals should have a will as it's the only way to ensure your wishes are followed for the distribution of your assets at the time of your death. It also allows you to select the person who will handle the settling of your estate, and that's the executor. If you die without a will, however, the province has one ready to go and impose on you. And while for some people, the result may be the same, a will makes it easier for the family left behind to manage your affairs. And as I said, to make sure that your wishes are followed. Yep, I got a question from Dave. Yeah. Bart, can I just grab a paper and write my will on a piece of paper and just go, this is good enough? Actually, that might just work. Uh, a few years ago, there were, were many changes made to the Wills and Estate Succession Act, WESA as it's called. And uh, yeah, in some cases that could be found as a legal will. In fact, there's a whole bunch of stuff that could be found as a legal will, but do you really want to take that chance? <laughs> I was just thinking that. Yeah, let's take a chance that maybe it'll work yeah. and maybe it won't. Yeah. And I, I would gather... And I don't know this. I mean, you're not a lawyer, you're a notary. So I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot on this, but it kind of made me think about it. The more ambiguous, for lack of a better word, in the creation of your will, like on a napkin, on yeah. a piece of paper or something like that, wouldn't that open more things to probably interpretation and challenge? Oh, absolutely. Maybe? You would think? I would think. I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. Go see an yeah, expert and, then. And I get a lot of clients that, that say, oh, we went online and got a will kit from, you know, whatever source. And that might work really well if you followed all the instructions just exactly right. And the source online was from a BC source as opposed to, you know, maybe California or okay. Florida. Ah, never thought about okay, that. Okay, but if, if I get a will, do I still sleep at night? <laughs> Getting a will is not going to um, hasten your death. Okay. 
You sure about that? I can't just kind of one little eye open. Okay, no, all right, just checking. You, just you, checking. you don't sleep depending who you're leaving. Yes, exactly. you put one eye open. <laughs> That's kind of the point I was making, Peter. That's kind of the point here. <laughs> so now let's get to, to the next big question. All right, so we, we're going to get a will. <laughs> I'm already twitching. All right, who should I choose as an executor? Well, that's mostly a case of preference. Um, the rules are that it must be someone age 19 or older, and they should be a Canadian resident. Okay. If a non-resident is selected as the executor, then it could result in um, some, some tax implications to your estate, which may create additional complications and added expense. You can, ex you can select one or more persons, and they can be required to act jointly or sequentially, that is a primary and an alternate. And that's typically what I suggest to clients. I'll give you this one, Dave, and, and, and thanks to Bart on this. Um, when my mom passed away years ago and my dad was updating the will, he just naturally went to, well, we'll just make my brother, yeah. who's the oldest, yeah. the executor. And I didn't even know at the time because my dad just went to Bart and, you know, handling other things for my family and helping out. And then all of a sudden it was, but wait a minute, my brother lives in California. <clears throat> and all of a sudden we went, wait, you realize that the estate all taxed in his name and the, the hassle. And then my, when my brother found out the rules, thanks to Bart, who kind of opened everyone's eyes real quick. Um, he went like, I'm not doing it. <laughs> talk to Pete, talk, talk to Peter. He does this for a living. I mean, but it was, it was really what Bart just said. It's the tax implication. So that's where, again, we're making a little light of this part, kind of just to have a little fun with this today. But you don't know those things if you're writing it on a napkin versus going to an expert like Bart who can at least say, hey, you might want to check this out or check that out, which is important. And just because of the area where yeah, we live, I have, I have several clients that their, their kids live in the States and, uh, and it comes up regularly. Oh. Let's move on to this. And I think this is a really serious question here because um, we've been having some fun with this, but I'll hold on here for a second. Should the executor and the guardian be different people if you've got children? I mean, this is serious stuff here because we're talking money, lots. <laughs> yeah. And and again, it's, it's just a, a matter of preference. Um, the two roles can be yeah. filled by the same person, uh, but it's not a requirement. It really comes down to finding the person that best meets the qualities required to fill those roles. Where minor children are concerned, the distinction is the guardian has the legal authority over the care of the children. The executor or trustee has authority over the management of any assets held in trust for those same minor children. In some cases, separating those duties is a sound decision, but in other cases, you may be comfortable with the same person person handling both. I, I look at it this way, Dave, because yeah. I'm guardian for someone, um, for their kids and whatnot. Sure. And they better live a long time for the sake <laughs> of those children being raised by me. Um, God help yes. them if they don't know. But but I look at it this way. Okay. It's a it's a I mean someone asks you to be a guardian of their children. I mean that's a that's a big nut wow. to ask and very humbling and and you know, you're like, wow, like they would even think of asking me to do that. Um, but, but to put the ad in, and this is, this is me as a registered financial planner view, definitely not the expertise of Bart in this category, but I look at it as by separating them in, in my advice, because dealing with finances every day, you're already asking such a big ask, trying to get them to also be in charge of all the finances. That's just an added burden of stress and maybe separating them like bart says they don't have to be but maybe separating them just takes a little off of that person's plate of responsibility if there if there is someone else right bart who you know can do the job for sure and of course you want those people working together that's oh exactly and and just from that same perspective the person that is best suited to you know take take control of your kids or manage your kids is not necessarily the best person to be managing the money. They're, they're two totally different um, sets of qualities. Yeah. Let's move on to this. Uh, again, we're talking about uh, the legal side of all of this. 
uh, because it is so critical, especially when you're coming to wills. Okay, you've got a power of attorney. Well, let's let's start with this simple question then. Can you select more than one? Because I, when I saw this, I, I kind of thought, no, no, you just need just one, right? One power of attorney, but maybe not. Well, that you do have that choice. Um, but just to back okay. up a, a step, just to help clarify sure. what exactly is a power of attorney. Um, so sure. where, where your will deals with things in the event of death, a power of attorney is in effect while you're alive and allows someone to act on your behalf for any legal or financial matter if you're not able to do things for yourself for any reason. It's, it goes into effect immediately upon you signing and remains in effect as long as you're alive unless you decide to cancel it or change it. You can select one person as the attorney or more than one if that's desired. The attorneys can be required to act jointly I don't typically recommend that just for logistical purposes, uh, or they can act separately. And again, that might be an either or situation or sequentially, uh, one as a primary, one as a backup. And the, the whole idea of power of attorney, um, many people think, well, I don't need that until I get old. But the problem is lots of things can go wrong while we're still yeah. young people like us. And, uh, you know, you just never know. You might be, uh, you know, stranded in some foreign country because the world has gone down in a, or has gone into a lockdown because of a global p pandemic. I've had uh, several situations yeah. arise. No, there. that's never going to happen, Bart. You're yeah, delusional. I know, I know. When would that ever happen? <laughs> exactly. I don't know about you, Peter, but I mean, so I get nervous when there's one attorney in the room. Now you're saying go with two. But okay. and, and, no. and we're going with the word power. Yes, right, Dave? No, they're, they're, they're called an attorney that doesn't make them a lawyer. Okay. So they have different powers though, right, Bart? From what I'm trying to read through the lines here. Uh, in what, in what way are you uh, thinking? Well, do they, can they, can they just act on, because I'm trying to decipher what you're saying here. Can they just act on, um, like, is there a power of attorney? Can all power of attorneys do kind of anything once they're granted that power of attorney? Yeah, well, okay, good question. Um, there are sort of two classifications, a general power of attorney, which is typically what we're dealing with. And that allows someone to act on your behalf for any sort of legal or financial transaction that you're not able to do for yourself. Um, to expand on that, it's also an enduring power of attorney, which simply means it remains in effect should you become mentally incompetent. Seems a bit redundant okay. for that, but, um, you know, because that's one of the main reasons for doing it in the first place. But in BC, that has to be specifically stated. The other option is what's referred to is as a specific power of attorney, and that lets someone just handle one particular transaction. Um, maybe it's dealing with your car at ICBC, or maybe it's for the specific purpose of selling a piece of property that you have, and you're not going to be here when closing time comes. So that's that's another option. But you know, I encourage people to have a general, so that can take effect if something should go south and, you know, let someone take care of everything. So I don't expand on this because it's yeah. interesting. If, yeah. a, if a parent names one of their children the power of attorney and they have an elderly parent, you know, just in case, <clears throat> God forbid, dementia, Alzheimer's sets in or something like that. And the child's the, or the child, the grown child in this case, you know, might be 50, 60 years old, is named the power of attorney they don't just get free reign to the cookie jar because the parent named them the power of attorney just in case something goes wrong with them. They have free reign in the sense that they can act in the parent's place, but there's very specific rules about what they can do with that person's money. They can't just go out and spend it willy-nilly on whatever they want. The funds have to be used for the care and needs of the, in this case, parent or adult as it's referred to. The attorney is very restricted on what they can do. And if they go outside of those lines, um, then they can go to jail for fraud. So if you're a wealthy parent 
and you name your grown adult or daughter the power of attorney and suddenly you find a McLaren in the driveway because they say they're <laughs> using it to drive you to your doctors or your physio appointments might be a might red be. flag maybe and, and the banks are unless of course you say I love to go to the doctors in a McLaren <laughs> yeah and the banks are pretty careful about watching for that sort of uh financial abuse um so, you know, there, there are some safeguards along the way, and that may be another reason for adding someone else as another attorney so that they're also involved in the process and have the ability to keep track of things as well. It, it seems to me that you can't be too careful in that respect. Um, but again, if you're coming in somewhat, you know, naive and I mean, and I'm someone like that. I mean, anytime a lawyer walks in the room, I get nervous. I just do um, for good reason. But anyways, having said that, <laughs> that's another story for another day. Um, what should someone who doesn't know what they don't know do? Well, start by having a conversation with a notary or lawyer to get the the full uh, in, you know package about what, what's needed. Sure. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be your kids that you appoint as the attorney. Maybe they're not the, the yeah. best option. If you don't have a friend, family member that you're comfortable with, you can also, you can also appoint a trust company. Um, any of the big banks have a trust arm. There's a couple of independent trust companies locally that also uh, act in that capacity. And that gives you um, at least someone that's gonna be there because the worst case scenario is you don't appoint anything, anyone and then something goes sideways and that becomes an even bigger problem. To say the least, to say the least. Um, let's throw this by you. What is a representation agreement? Again, I'm, st I'm starting to speak as much legalese as I can. What is that thing? Well, it's very similar to a power of attorney, but uh, where the power of attorney deals with legal and financial matters, a representation agreement is appointing someone to act on your behalf to make medical and personal uh, personal care decisions. So, you know, if you get taken to the hospital unconscious and can't respond or you're in a coma, then someone else has the authority to make the necessary decisions. Sounds simple, but I'm, I'm, I'm making notes as we roll along here now. It gets us to the, the ultimate question, and you just threw this out here. Who should that person be? I mean, who should get that representation agreement? I mean, what, what are the qualities that you're looking for? And it can't be just somebody that you happen to like. Um, it, and it can't even be more than, than just, hey, oh, I trust them. If they don't really know, you know what I mean? That's the scary part. What you don't know can, can absolutely create all sorts of nightmares. So um, in, in BC, if you have not appointed anyone specifically to act on your behalf for medical decisions, the province has a pretty good default mechanism in place. Um, it goes to your next of kin, basically. So uh, it goes in the order of um, your spouse, an adult child, parent, sibling, grandparents, adult grandchild, anyone related by birth or adoption, even close friends or someone immediately re related by marriage. So in-laws, step-parent, step-child. Marriage. Yeah. So he said the- Don't he, say children with, with, with Dave involved. He cringes. He said the M word. Dave, he said the it M can't word. be the dog. It can't be the dog, Dave. Bentley, I think, would do a hell of a job. He, he knows how to bark. Uh, so, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Those individuals are referred to as a temporary substitute decision maker. But what's key there okay. is it's anyone at any given level has equal status. So if you've got five kids, well, then any one of the kids would have equal authority to make decisions. It's whoever the doctors get a hold of first. Um, if it's your parents, then either of your parents would have that choice if they're both alive. So for lots of clients, that works perfectly well. And so they don't necessarily need to appoint anyone specifically. But for others, you know, I'll go back to the example, if you've got five kids, well, maybe it's only one or two of them that you'd want making those kinds of decisions for whatever reason. And in that case, you'd want to yeah. um, 
appoint them specifically under the representation agreement. I've got one for you, Dave, and Bart won't talk about it. I won't say names, but I'm going to, he, he rescued someone I know uh, about three years ago where, and this is going to find hard to believe, yeah. but the point of this is if you suspect something smells, ask questions because I, I know of a case where the wife, the much younger wife, um, basically made it look like the, um, her spouse, much older spouse with health problems, yeah. couldn't act on his own. And she, for lack of a better term, gave false answers and falsely got a representation agreement through a friend, through, through someone who probably shouldn't have, um, done it to put it bluntly. And I, I can say this, and this wasn't, wasn't in town here, not in the lower mainland. Bart was able to po point this client in the right decision to get proper independent help to get this elderly gentleman, gentleman out of a very bad, dangerous situation because the person who was given the power wasn't looking after his best interest. And unfortunately, she had one person, it's not everyone, you're not going to see that, at the home who was... Wow working on her behalf. So if you're ever not sure, don't worry about offending someone. Talk to a notary, as I'm sure Bart will suggest, talk to a lawyer and at least ask a question until you get peace of mind. There's nothing wrong with you asking the question. Absolutely. I want to get your thoughts about that because the thing is, there's an intimidation factor. When you don't know what you don't know, you don't even know the right questions to ask. You know what I'm talking about? So how do you find that person, which, which is what Peter's just talking about, that you can trust to step back and say, look, I don't know. Help me. Well, start by, having a, yeah, start by having a discussion with yeah. your local notary or lawyer. Sure. Um, and yeah. Speaking to clients, if they feel comfortable uh, with, you know, dealing with me, then that's great. There is a distinction between what notaries can do and what lawyers can do. You know, if it gets starts to get more complicated, then absolutely they're going to have to talk to a lawyer. But I'm going to be the first person to point that out. I've, I had a situation just this past week where we probably had a 20, 30 minute conversation and things were going in a direction that clearly indicated they needed the help of a lawyer. So I say thank you very much. Anything else I can do for you in the future, please let me know. But right now, it looks like you're going to have to talk to a lawyer. If you don't know one, I've got some names for you. But, um, you know, I, my services weren't uh, available f for their particular situation. But it's have, it's starting the conversation and, and just getting things out in the open as to what, you know, what, what your situation requires and what's the best way of going about it. Here's the thing I want to throw by you. Does it surprise you or um, at this stage of the game, probably not, how family, <laughs> I say that carefully because <laughs> I'm not talking about the Sopranos here, um, but family can turn on each other like that when there's a big bag of money that's on the table. And you know where I'm going with this. How do you, how do you avoid that or can you avoid that? Because it is what it is. It's, it's greed, it's selfishness. It's, it's a lot of things. What it isn't is, is the love of the family that somehow gets kicked to the curb. David doesn't take a big bag of money. It might be the, uh, Oh, a small bag, a small bag could do or that. The clock Whoa. on the mantle. Um, yeah, no. How, how do you avoid it? I, I wish I had some magic yes. answers, probably having open conversations, uh, around the family dinner table would help set the stage. Yeah. Um, some, I know, um, oftentimes people have different, uh, versions of what happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. Well, they just stopped talking <laughs> to us. Yeah. Well, that yes. might've been because of something that was said or done, you know, by other family members. So, you know, there's, it's never, uh, two sides to the story. It's usually at least three. Yeah. Yeah. To, to say the least. Yeah. Um, it, when you go for the family dinner and you look behind some pictures or underneath some uh, <laughs> clock on the mantle, as Bart said, 
if you see sticky notes, there might be an uh, issue coming up down the road. Yes. <laughs> and I say that because I've heard stories of it. It's happened. And I'm sure Bart and me, with the amount of years yeah. we've had in this business, yeah. that could be a day long podcast, probably telling stories about things we've heard. Wow. And they're not pleasant, a lot of them. And people end up, I know of a case where one case where I know more than one, but one in particular, I think of right off the top of my head, where two sister or a sister and a brother, sorry, because of the death of a sister and the death of a parent, have not talked since probably 98. Wow. Wow. Over, as Bart said, it wasn't a big bag of money, but they still don't talk. Wow. See, the thing, and I'll throw this so, to, to you as sad. well, is that when this comes, you know, to become the reality that you're dealing with, suddenly, you know, that, that house or the piece of real estate that was bought 30, 40 years ago, sometimes even longer than that, for a very, very small amount of money is now worth seven figures. How much does that fuel it? That things that, you know, when you look at your parents or whoever is involved in this, all right, that what seemed to be this big is now, as I said before, that big and it changes people. Oh, yeah. I mean, how, how much of that do you do you deal with? Well, f fortunately or unfortunately, as the case may be, I'm involved on the front end of things as a notary. So preparing uh, the wills. Okay. Um, at okay. this stage in the game, notaries not are not allowed to assist with the probate, which is at the back end of the game. Um, which is probably when those kinds of issues come to light a little more. So, as I said, fortunately or unfortunately, um, I don't have to get involved at that end. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but your life isn't nearly as exciting, Bart. Trust yes. me. Where's the drama? Where's the drama? And that's not, and that's not really a bad thing no, at that no, point. No. But if, if, you, if you have a past mortgage and, and you sell, then who's responsible for paying it out? That's the other side of this coin. Oh, well, in the case of a, a property being sold, it's always the seller's responsibility yeah. to make okay. sure that those mortgages are paid. And really, it boils, it comes down to the lawyer or notary that's acting on their behalf. We process the payment, but it is the property owner's obligation to make sure that gets paid. Hmm. Um. Do you know, you mentioned, we, we got into this just a little bit, and I do want to touch on it here. General notarizations, okay. Do you have some examples of, of that, that that you can really kind of give us some clarity um, in, in small little words that I can understand? Yeah. So I got one. I got one. Okay. I got one. I got one. I got one. I got one. Well, yeah. COVID, COVID was here, okay. right? And. I had to do a trip down south, but we know the border's not open. So you know of a lot of people were getting cars and things taken across the border. Well, I have a brother, as I mentioned earlier, who's American. Oh, okay. So okay. he had to get a car down to the States for me. So what did we do? I called my friendly notary, Bart Aldrich. Ah, okay. Bart Aldrich did general notarization of forms so that... If they question my brother at the border, whose car is this? Do you have permission to drive it? Yada, yada, yada. Bart can expand from there. But the forms were signed and my brother never had a hassle. That's about the only one I know, Bart. Sorry. Yeah. So general notarizations, it's just other documents that um, have to be signed and witnessed in, in front of a notary. And by signing it in front of a notary, you're swearing the information provided is true. And if you're lying about that, you're going to go to jail for perjury. Um, so that's the significance of it. But specific examples, Peter's is, is one. Um, we're also now seeing a lot more travel consents. So if a parent is traveling on vacation and taking one or two or whatever uh, of their minor kids and the other parent isn't able to go with them, well, then they need a letter when they cross the border to show that the parent not traveling has consented to that child going across the border. Uh, other typical examples, if you have an insurance loss, so if your car has been stolen or smashed up, um, then you'll have to provide a form to ICBC and it just gives the details of the accident. 
they want it witnessed. Um, you know, lots of document, different kinds of documentation like that. Sometimes it's already prepared and the client just has to fill it in and sign it in my presence. Other times it might be something that, that I prepare for them and then have them sign. With all this detail, uh, how important is it to keep a family together? Because when they start fighting over, as we've been just been talking about it, it can it can destroy a family. Money's a funny thing like that, especially when you're dealing with wills and all the things that we've just been talking about. I do want to get your thoughts about that as we are rolling into, into this, this whole thing. Well, that's really where a team of professionals um, come, comes into play. Yeah. If they've got someone like Peter that's helping to manage their funds and ensuring that, you know, they've got the funds necessary. And then on the back end, a lawyer or notary can prepare a will that allows that money to be distributed to their family in the manner they choose. It might be equally amongst kids or it might not be depending on what the needs and situation of the kids are. But that's where teamwork um, really, you know, helps solve all those kinds of problems or at least address them. Maybe not solve them all, but address them as best we can. <laughs> at least they're talking. You know, one thing we do, Dave, I know when we're doing meetings like this and I've, I've got a lot of clients, I'll say, okay, your next step is to go talk to Bart, et cetera, you know, to get to that stage. But when we're working on the financial plan, what we do just out of a good, just in case practice, if you will, when we do the meeting that has these discussions, like every meeting for that matter, we write all the notes down. And then after the meeting's done, we send those notes out to all the involved parties. So one day down the road, I don't remember that ever happening. No, that's not what I said. Well, here's the email that went to you two years ago and you had no problem with the email then. So why suddenly do you have a problem with the email now? Oh, right. I get it because you made bad business decisions and you're in debt. Mm -hmm. So you want mom and dad's money from the house. I mean, I've got, I know of a case where one parent passed away, very sad, and, and the will was very simple. It went to everything goes to the other parent, which probably is in a lot of cases kind of standard, right? right. Bart, if the other parents yeah, absolutely. alive. And two of the three children wanted what they perceived as half of the estate. So they didn't want mom's estate to go to dad. They wanted half of the total estate to be to be divided amongst the kids and they wanted it now total unrealistic not based on the will nothing it's just we're gonna make dad's life a living you know what and we want our chunk and our pound of flesh yeah. now and that's how <laughs> i see it and it's sad but i i tell this being the pessimist and kind of not just a pessimist but erring on the side of caution as i say or worst case scenario i tell people that when it comes to these estate matters, because I'm, I'm the guy a lot of times, unlike Bart, who does prepare them at the front end. I'm the guy who is doing the plan, who has the life insurance that has to be paid out or yeah. talking to the portfolio manager about the money or whatever, who does the back end. And I, I tell people a lot of time, be prepared. If you have brothers and sisters, one or two of you will end up never talking yeah. to each other again, oh. most likely. It's sad, oh. but the odds are more in that favor than everyone getting along and singing Kumbaya, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, because there's always one right. Bart, who seems to feel entitled and think some more of this money is theirs. Being an executor is, is the most, I'd say the most thankless job in the world. Well, what, what I tell clients, it's a, it's a great honor to be named, but it's a huge responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Does it not get back to what we were talking about earlier? The importance of having the will so that the lawyers have already come and gone and that you're not looking to go and, and, and get yourself a lawyer to go and change things. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I can't express that enough because I've seen it in my family and it was just an absolute nightmare. It's what Peter was saying. All of a sudden, Christmas just isn't Christmas anymore <laughs> because, uh, you know what I mean? You're fighting over money because there wasn't a will. Yeah. No, so I just, uh, again, I just want to get your final thoughts about the significance and importance of getting the will and having the right people put it together. No, absolutely. Have, starting the discussion is, is first and foremost. Um, and then it, you can go from there and determining, you know, depending on what your 
uh, financial situation is, what your assets consist of. Different assets have different classifications, so they, they may go through the will or they may go outside of the will. Um, but just determining what's best in your specific circumstances and in accordance with your wishes and just getting all the options. So what happens, you know, in this situation, what can I do? What can I avoid this or that? And just, you know, having those discussions. Uh, typically, I'll speak with clients for about an hour, um, but it may go back and forth for two, three, four weeks while they think about it, come back with more questions. Um, it's it's certainly not a just fill in the blanks and here here's your will. Uh, pump it out, you know, that style. Since we've gone full circle kind of, Bart, and back from all the other things you do, here's one I kind of thought of along the way. And I get asked this question a lot, and <laughs> you know me, I deflect. Ask Bart. <laughs> ask Bart the question. But the question we get, and you know this, Bart, all the time we get this, What are what's a red flag or a, a major thing that you would say to someone, okay, it's probably a good time to look at updating your will. Is there a few kind of obvious things you can say to our viewers and listeners to say, you know what, this is something that says to me, yeah, it's probably a good time to talk about getting an update. Well, I guess it, de it depends on the sort of the age category of your clients, but certainly uh, buying a house is a good time to start looking at it for, for younger people getting married, um, entering into a relationship that doesn't qualify as a spouse. So if you're not, if you haven't been living together in a marriage-like relationship for two years or more, then from an estate planning perspective, you're not considered spouses. So you'd certainly want to have a will to allow things to go back and forth to each other. Uh, having once you have kids, so that you can name a guardian. Um, you know, do, do your circumstances change along the way? The kids are no longer minors, so you don't need guardians appointed. Maybe grandchildren come along. Um, family members die. Uh, the person that you've selected as your executor 30 years ago, well, now they don't know what day of the week it is. So you want them handling your affairs? Wow. So, you know, it, it's endless. Generally speaking, um, we would suggest that people review their will every three to five years or if something significant changes in their life. The other thing to consider is rules change and your situation may not have changed but the rules in BC might, which might dictate a new will or at least some change made to it. Yeah, I like the stories I get, Dave, and I send, yeah. I send these to Bart. I really do. Yeah. When someone comes in and we're doing a financial plan, and it's one of our first things as a registered financial planner we're supposed to ask is, do you have a will? And when was it last updated? And I had one the other day. Well, when so-and-so, our first child was born. And I know the age of the people. And how old's your first child now? 37. Um, and, and then it's immediately, I'm not a notary. I can't say for sure, yeah. but you might want to give them a call. Yeah. Because <laughs> if that's out of date, you can only imagine what the rest of it looks like. Uh, I, I can't tell you how important this has been for me because I know who I'm going to be calling first thing tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. Bentley the dog no. is not the executor. <laughs> Bentley the dog no. is just a beneficiary, you know, because we know Brenda's looking That's after right. Bentley. <laughs> I can't go to sleep every night with one eye open. Okay. <laughs> but we can certainly make provisions to make sure that Bentley is well cared for. Okay, sure. <laughs> it's always yeah. great, great talking to you. Uh, Bart, I tell you, I've learned so much out, out of all this, uh, and it is incredibly appreciative. Um, like I said, um, I'll try to get some sleep tonight, but I think I'm going to make a phone call tomorrow morning. <laughs> I appreciate your time, Bart. I think there's going to be a lot of people who are going to watch this yes. and just, well, if nothing else, they'll ask me less questions. <laughs> um, but, but you made a lot of these things really easy to understand, and I appreciate Happy your time. to help. Glad to be here, and uh, all the best. Thank you much. We appreciate it. There you go. Bart Eldridge, a notary republic. Um, and that's it for the show. Uh, thanks for following and sharing on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube. Any questions, simply go to yourmoney at everythingfinancial.com. Peter, 
let's do this again real soon. That's not a promise. Well, it's a threat. No, see you in another two weeks, Dave. We'll be having another one hit the airwaves. So I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Adios.